I've been dealing the, the kind of like a strong opinion thing. I, I think people just need to relax and ch- let people ch- choose whatever they want to. You know, if, if security is the issue, like just use something that is more secure, pay more gas. Um, you know, people just need to be more open into uh, whatever innovation uh, there is. And I, I really hate it because I see, I see constantly over the years where, you know, there's um, there is a lot of like kind of like um, camps where, you know, it's just tech, you know, and they have different kinds of use cases eventually where they're going to steer towards. So it's it's uh, it, it's more interesting to just, you know, be heads down and building things than, than just arguing. 100% agree. And I, I appreciate the pragmatism. Thank you for joining me, Stani. Super excited to uh, make this happen. Uh, I just called DM you and uh, we ultimately got this podcast set up. So really appreciate you taking time. Uh, been a long time fan of what you've been building. Uh, I think you're a pioneer in the industry, kind of pushing the space forward. So I've been looking forward to making this happen. Yeah, definitely. And I'm super excited to um, be here. I, I do get a lot of DMs and and I very <laughs> kind of respond to them Um but I, I found that it's um, it's an interesting opportunity to talk about uh, what's happening um, on Lens and also in the Aave ecosystem. 100%. Well, maybe just to start it off there, uh, I think a lot of people are ultimately kind of familiar with what you originally built with Aave. And I think people are now starting to become even more aware of your push with Lens. But could you maybe just speak to the high level of kind of not transitioning, but deciding to venture out and build a social product, uh, because I think that's kind of not a 180, but definitely different than uh, what was kind of originally built or what you built in the DeFi ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, I've um, the, the way I usually see that there's uh, different kinds of um, uh, challenges and opportunities to solve, um, you know, in, in, in the society and, and in humanity and um uh, in, in different industries, and I think with um, with blockchain and Web three, you can apply the the technology to solve different kinds of things. So, for me, um, uh, I started to program very early. So um, I think I was um, thirteen or so years old. So we we used to play a lot of um, Counter Strike with my uh, brother, and uh, we used to build servers uh, to host LAN parties uh, back in Finland and. You know, we got super excited about, he got super excited about programming uh, kernels uh, and, and on the hardware side um, and, and the Linux infrastructure. And I got more excited about um, basically programming more on on the uh, uh, internet that was getting more and more adoption. So like I started to build, um, I would say like social media applications as well um, back in, in the Web2 um, era and I was super young. I wasn't sure what I was doing, um, and everyone wanted to build um, some sort of uh, better version of Reddit um, or a um, as some sort of a way of actually um, curating everything, all the content that comes from slash uh, slash dots, dig, and and Reddit and and a bunch of other uh, platforms. So that was like a very exciting uh, time. But later, um, when I got a bit older. Um, and I was, um, um, I, I think I was just applying for uh, university in my early twenties. I got more excited about uh, finance. So, so, so with my last years of studying, I, I basically started to get more excited about um, you know what Ethereum can do and and um, the programmable part of finance. So, so definitely that there's like two different areas, um, and I always been excited about more than one thing. Um, so that's, I I kind of knew that DeFi was a part where I want to dedicate, you know, a lot of years from my life and, um, going onwards, I want to contribute, but also I know there's other challenges to solve, uh, beyond, uh, finance as well. Yeah. I mean, you're tackling two massive industries. I think finance, uh, being huge in its own right. And then the other being kind of with social, just like the fabric of society. So uh, no small problems indeed. I think it, <laughs> yeah. the earlier... I, I something easier for sure. Uh, <laughs> there's there's fun. But honestly, like everything uh, built on Web3 is, is so early and it's so nascent that um, I, I really respect everyone who is 
uh, in the space, right, especially right now, um, and obviously built in the past and, and achieved to, to move the space forward. But especially now on, on the DeFi space, a lot of the gaps can uh, are, uh, in, so to speak, filled. So you have a lot of uh, you know, financial infrastructure on chain. Um, so I appreciate people who are here and trying to build the, the next generation uh, DeFi. But also like, um, I appreciate also kind of like going beyond finance and trying to figure out how we could use blockchain to maybe secure your online profile, um, you know, your content and data availability and, and figure out greater uh, monetization and, and other uh, challenges. So, so I, I think everyone in the space is, is uh, tackling very cool issues and, and hard things to solve as well. 100%. And I, I was going to say, like, ultimately, I, I think DeFi kind of uniquely lended itself and like AMM, borrow and lending to the early versions of Ethereum uh, because you didn't need super high throughput. Uh, you just needed the smart contract capability. And then I think uh, as you've kind of been expanding on the social side, to me, in my point of view, it's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. You need the most throughput and uh, oh. kind of a lot of computation or uh, quite a bit, but not as much. But on the throughput side, you need quite a bit to ultimately make these happen. So you kind of took both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. And also, I think uh, that that's actually a very interesting observation because we, you know, on the DeFi side, we, we definitely approach from the kind of like a more uh, uh, security aspect of uh, um, <clears throat> and, and ensuring that you have the strongest finality and execution layer for financial transactions. And, and a bit later, actually, uh, with the layer twos and networks like Polygon and Avalanche, we, we basically realized that well, actually, um, you know, these networks are bringing a lot of users. So how we could actually expand beyond the Ethereum and, and, and the security guarantees that Ethereum is uh, bringing, including uh, uh, then also layer twos. Um, but, but, but with the Web3 Social, it's a um, completely different kind of a perspective because um, you will have to think about, because, you know, finance, you're moving um, figures of um, numbers in a database but you need to be you need to be very um, uh, I would say like you, you need to have quite good uh, security on those numbers because obviously they affect the whole system like DeFi the blockchain system financial system. But when it comes to Web3 Social, um, actually there's different kinds of um, artifacts. So for example, there's a concept of uh, a profile. There, there's a uh, concept of uh, like a follower graph. Um, and, and content amplification um, and basically different things that relate to social media. And then you have to think about like, what is the amount of security you're applying um, to, to um, be successful on what you're doing? So it's kind of like a more of granular uh, approach. And, and we realized that you kind of need a hybrid stack. And I think this is the reason why previously the uh, blockchain-based uh, social media uh, networks um, and also kind of like the perception isn't uh, really appealing because um, it's not like one uh, you know you, you're not you shouldn't supposed to use blockchain at the same security level into all these artifacts but you need to figure out which of these artifacts need that security and we recognize that profiles uh, you know the names uh, handles that you might have and also uh, your follow graph might be those that actually need that and then uh, for content, you might only need um, in content ampl amplification. You might need only data availability. So just one one of the component that the blockchain has, and that reduces the cost and increases throughput um, uh, significantly. Yeah, I. It's kind of like uh, you're pioneering a maze and trying to figure out how to ultimately put all these pieces together. Uh, I think, as you mentioned, it's trying to figure out which parts should be on chain, which parts should be off chain. And then ultimately like the big bottleneck of like true scale is kind of that high throughput uh, on the data availability layer and uh, making sure that you can actually have enough data to post all these transactions on chain. And cause it's not easy. And I, I think, as I said, like finance can kind of be one aspect and kind of, especially in what we built early on, but social media, especially at scale is in a completely different game. So, uh, Kudos to you for you and your team kind of uh, pioneering this new space. In terms of kind of 
ultimately, maybe let's start with Lens, the product in itself. And then I would love to talk about the infrastructure stuff afterwards too. But on Lens itself, what is kind of like the vision? I know ultimately uh, we have kind of the social media monopolies today. Uh, There's not very many choices. And when you kind of blend in the Web3 aspects of like ownership and even the money aspect, it lends kind of a lot of unique properties that you now have to possibly integrate into the social stack. Can you kind of think about how you approach it when creating Lens and the product? Yeah, I, uh, the, the way I see it is that um, Lens is a protocol uh, that has that on-chain blockchain-based components um, that secure a certain type of uh, artifacts in social networking. <clears throat> but then you have actually also um, the data availability component. Uh, that's the uh, Momoka, um, what we released uh, very recently, actually. And then um, there's other types of... Um, layers that that are um, part of that off-chain component. And the idea there is that um, what we believe is certain aspect of um, networking, social networking should be uh, decentralized, meaning that um, there shouldn't be actually someone that has an access control, um, let's say over your online profile um, or your audience. So what we do believe is that... um, the kind of like an internet and, and social networking should be built in a way where whatever you, you, you create or create in terms of um, social capital and your presence online, you should be have a, a full access and control uh, into that. Um, so that's very valuable. And I think that's the kind of like a key component there. And you should be able to build audience and connect with different people um, and create also have an easy way of monetizing um, from your create creativity or whatever you are sharing, tra- trading. And those things are kind of like a built into the Lens protocol. So there is uh, a monetization, monetization layer, which is a bit more Web3 native. So it's uh, based on the idea of collecting content um, and being able to share and amplify content by uh, mirroring. You can also... Um, distributed fees. So in in some ways, what we are envisioning is that the social media in the future um, and internet itself should be kind of a a something that benefits all. So um, this also means that different clients that are built on Lens, um, ironically, when we launched the Lens protocol last year, so now it's uh, um, a bit over one year anniversary of uh, Lens, Mainnet release. Um, it's got to feel good to uh, cross the year mark. It's it feels very weird because um, I think we've been building for two years now, um, and <laughs> it, it just feels that um, the time goes super fast, um, and there's so much to actually do before um, it's it starts to be in a place where it's it's super flexible and, and scalable. Um, but Lens uh, it launched without any clients and front ends. So what happened is that a lot of these uh, community members, they actually started to build that um, infrastructure that didn't exist. So we have Lenser, which is a purely open source uh, client that anyone can go in and you know use. They can even fork it um, and create their own version. There's Orb, um, Butterfly. These are mobile uh, clients, um, Lensta and, and Pinsta. There's some of them actually mimic quite a lot of the existing social media applications. Some are more original. Um, there's a project called Enzo, and it's basically creating a digital wardrobe for um, uh, for you, where you can collect um, wearables uh, and it's powered by Lens Protocol. So there's sort of exciting things happening and um, novel experiences, including music NFTs. So Riff is another application where uh, they focus on actually the the, the music uh, creators and empowering them with 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 the um, NFT collections. So it's interesting that um, kind of like that you have all this um, this this whole ecosystem of applications and it just um, creates an uh, a, a way of 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 benefiting bit, between different applications. So for example, one application might. Um, be involved in, in the content creation. So you might be using Orb and the content is created there. 
uh, another user might share it on Linster and a third one will see it on Butterfly and, and collects that content. So you can actually share fees across all the participants and even algorithms um, and, and creators and users that were involved in creating in that process. So you, what we're envisioning is that the future is kind of a, a very shareable um, an environment uh, where it's it's basically controlled by by those users, and I, I think that's the kind of like a path we're uh, moving towards. It is kind of a beautiful vision. Ultimately, the important aspects kind of live on chain or in Polygon, and you can remake and kind of remix those as you were kind of describing with different front ends, different kind of product suites. I, I can imagine in the future, even like different algorithms that you would want for your feed versus others. Uh, it, it is pretty remarkable and much different than kind of the world that we in ex currently exist in today, where there's only one way to really monetize your content. And that's kind of with ads yeah. and, or subscriptions. And then you I can really that. design it. And I think it's a, it's kind of uh, interesting, like because because of the because of the monetization model, it really steers all the applications towards the the, the same metrics. So I I think um, we should be using this, the exactly the same me metrics across all these social media applications that we have. Um, it also even in um, um, between the lens clients. So um, what's interesting is because the monetization is ad driven, it also means that. Um, that that the the engagement and how much you can charge of those ads are based on how much the users are spending time on the applications. Meaning that um, if you have an interesting idea that you want to build, where users will come maybe once a week um, to that application uh, and it's social, uh, maybe it's even like a, you know it's 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 kind of like a mental health aware social application or built in a that direction, you can't really build a good system or a good product and monetize if, if the whole industry is, has the same kind of like a model of, of, of monetization. So I really think that flexibility for developers and also eventually what you mentioned, um, choice uh, for the users is the, 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 the big um, use case because you can actually start selecting things that are valuable for you without... Um, you know, and actually having that choice in the first place, there's no incentives for uh, social media platforms to, to basically open up their network because that will mean that, you know, a lot of people will be grabbing that uh, traffic. Yeah, you're disrupting them from the very core at the social graph, which is not easy. And I, I think maybe going back to kind of you kind of spearheading the this charge on the social media side uh and social platform really i would say blockchains in whole are still very early in kind of scaling and we're trying different solutions um ethereum was obviously kind of the first with smart contracts and then uh really pioneered l2s and pushing this space forward how was your kind of design decision ultimately to deploy on polygon and then what did you learn kind of on Lens just in the past year of actually being live on Polygon and what pushed you from Polygon to then Momoka? I think it's been quite an um, amazing experience. So th the way we see the, especially initially and even now, I, I think there's a big compatibility um, between Web3 applications in general. Um, so something that we kind of learned from the Ava playbook is that we tend to build in a way where... Um, the applications are able to talk to each other. So even the Lens uh, protocol itself has been built in a way where we haven't built every single thing that you can, on, even on a protocol level, but we have left a lot of design space um, as much as we can uh, for community developers or um, art entrepreneurs that want to create a business um, by using uh, Lens protocol or build even uh, a game. Um, end of the day, it's a Web3 social layer, so you can plug it, plug it in into um, pretty much any use case. Do you feel you like want. composability is like a core fabric of like Web3 that like is uniquely enabled? Or I, I'm curious, like how you think about composability, because some of the different architectures 
not fragment it, but just make it a little bit harder. And I think even being involved early on in DeFi, uh, we saw what awesome stuff ultimately happened with DeFi Summer in 2022. Uh, There's a lot of interesting things. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> Those good yields. Like, yeah. Good, <laughs> good yields, good good yeah. food tokens. Um, yeah. It was definitely interesting. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, th- there is a lot of value in capability. So I, I do think that um, it creates some sort of interesting dynamics because, um, at some point, the infrastructure we're relying upon, um, the users are very, they can switch from one provider to another one relatively easily. Um, I have this concept called uh, liquid citizen, uh, which basically means that um, you might be um, um, like the switching cost between one thing to another um, is relatively low and, and you might even have the relatively same risk reward uh, there. So. So it's going to be very hard to keep um, users in one particular protocol. Um, and, and the aspect of loyalty becomes a um, very interesting topic on how you can actually retain uh, users. And I think one of those ways to do that is to, to basically um, ensure that those users uh, also are owning and governing uh, a, a protocol that they're contributing into and, and using. I think that's the vision of... of um, our team as well, where we see kind of like a more people powered uh, internet that basically benefits all. And that means that you could still have an infrastructure and internet where um, you have businesses. So the, the, the biggest problem about internet is that it's very uh, much driven and owned by the businesses. So, you know, the, the most traffic and uh, the, the, the most interactions and, and activities happen actually on a business owned platforms um, and the users really don't get um, part of that uh, benefit. And what we're saying is that in the future, users become valuable part of the internet where they are getting that part of, uh, um, uh, they, they're getting part of that upside that internet uh, brings. Um, but it doesn't mean that the companies will uh, disappear. I, I think it just becomes more uh, democratic an environment. Um, and I, I think, so, so going back to this idea of uh, loyalty, um, is that it's definitely going to be a hard way to retain uh, users. But at the same time, uh, what's amazing is that if you create something very exciting and um, innovative, you can attract a lot of users from the same uh, network. So the way I want to, the way I usually try to explain is that um, do you remember the loot game? So there was yes, the yes, it was loot. super popular. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, at least for a moment uh, on the venture capital kind of bought a lot, and I'm curious ultimately where where it's going to end up. I I think they're still kind of uh, charging forward on the different aspects. Yeah, and I, I think what's um, what was cool about loot is that you know they just gave a a, a little bit of piece of information in form of yeah. NFTs what a game could be. And you saw other people coming and, and contributing into that game in an extremely or, or organic way. And if you already had a um, uh, the load back, you could actually, with that NFT, claim other things in the ecosystem. So you're like you're reigniting um, existing uh, network effects. And I think the same thing happens on a larger scale on Ethereum uh, and other networks. So, for example, when when you have um, uh, if you have a wallet, you have an Ethereum address or Polygon address or whatnot, what actually happens is that um, you see constantly different kinds of social events. So that might be the DeFi summer, that might be NFT summer, people minting uh, monkey pictures, um, then it might be um, uh, some sort of other event like uh, the meme coins, for example. So you see this kind of like a behavior that is just attracting a lot of um, users in, in at one particular a point. And those are social events. So the way Lens works is that uh, once you create your profile, um, you, can na- you, you can now access the whole uh, Lensverse. And, and that consists of different applications, uh, use cases, uh, what people have built and developers have built on the uh, ecosystem. So for example, there's currently um, 117,000 uh, profiles minted on on um, Lens, but what's Impressive. fascinating is that it's not a really big number, but it's just a number that 
is interesting to to follow. It's not our North Star metric either because the Lens protocol is still uh, beta. But it was fascinating is that if you create um, a new game, for example, uh, on Lens, you can you can take the same uh, user base and and provide them that uh, game and, and kind of like a re-engage. And I think that's that's the power and the beauty of the system because you can that way uh, leverage the existing user base, but at the same time, um, you can also bring new users into the ecosystem. Um, and some of these applications, they might be even a bit more you know, disposable. Um, so you might have an application, a game uh, that has only, you can play it, let's say, 10,000 times and then it's over, you know, and it's, it becomes, um, you don't have access anymore or there's some other rules. So you, it, it's, it's really fascinating how open the design space is. I, f- I fully agree. And uh, 120,000 ish users does not, or active addresses does not seem uh, crazy on the surface, but I would say for Web3, that's very impressive because there's not very many people actually doing things on chain, at least not on skill yet. So uh, really kudos to you and the team. It, you said if that's not the North Star, at least at the moment, what what would you describe as the North Star as, of Lens? It's, a, it's an interesting question because um, we've been trying to figure out like what's, what is the North Star from the protocol perspective and, and, and then a bit more uh, widely? So I think uh, <clears throat> on the protocol perspective, we, we, we know that something that is very um, important is obviously like what is the, the, the quality of the graph? Um, so the user base, um, what kind of activity the users are having and um, how, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to say that's how like... I would say like in nature, you have this um, idea of uh, biodiversity um, and biodiversity has some sort of a value, um, but it's very hard to quantify. Um, so our kind of like a North Star metric in some ways is that biodiversity that applies to specific lens protocol, um, but also the component of actually how much value the protocol creates for the users. So so, so the monetization layer does have, have a lot of um, impact, especially if if we think about that, if if people um, in the future that they get benefit on all the services that they're using because they're users um, and they get some sort of upside, um, that component is um, very valuable. Um, but we're still we don't have anything locked in because it's a very hard um, question to answer. Um, but I think um, every application and client that has been built on Lens they definitely should have some sort of a custom um, North Star that is important for them that necessarily isn't what the traditionally like social media um, space has uh, has um, has used to. I, I do fully agree. The monetization is super important and can ultimately uh, push the application in a variety of ways. So uh, it, it is hard to get cr- correct. I think in crypto more broadly, we're still trying to figure out different monetization methods, what works, what doesn't work. But I'd say the other side of that is also just figuring out scaling the applications versus building the application. How how much of the time do you feel like the, the team that you built has been focused on like either scaling the core infrastructure with Mocha or working with the Polygon team to actually like focusing on like product development? Yeah, so so be, so we we usually try to solve issues as they come. <laughs> so yeah, that makes and, sense. And I, think, <laughs> and I think it's valuable uh, also like guidance and lesson for everyone. So not to build a complete system, but build something small, um, see how it works, and iterate. Um, obviously, on the smart contract level, it's more harder because um, you're able to maybe um, deploy something new once a year. Uh, maybe every six months, depending on how big of a change it is. Um, but, you know, um, not usually more frequently than than that, unless it's small uh, incremental uh, changes. And um, I, I would say that the scalability challenge came to us when we saw actually that there's more users using actively on a daily basis um, the, the protocol and it generated a lot of um, gas costs. So, the, the cool thing, how the user experience works acro- across the, all the clients is that whenever you create a, a post or a comment, it reflects in the UI 
right away. So it feels like a normal social media application. But what happens in the back end is um, the, the background is that um, a on-chain transaction is initiated, um, it's set to the queue and and and, and submitted in on-chain. Um, and also uh, the, you don't pay gas, you don't sign transactions. Those are delegated to a so-called dispatcher that is managing all that um, activity. Um, so th that's, that's kind of like a, in terms of like user experience for Web3 applications, it's really, uh, powerful and, and it feels intuitive with, with Momoka, the, the, um, the difference is actually that we create transactions, blockchain transactions, and we simulate as we will do, we will submit normal transactions. So we simulate whether those transactions are, are valid against Lens protocol on-chain rules and if they are, uh, we take the transaction that is signed by the user's uh, wallet um, and we submit it through Bundler, um, kind of like an aggregation um, transaction management service for Arviv. Um, and Arviv is a data availability layer. So we submit them uh, there. So we, we basically create uh, Lens protocol compatible transactions. And instead of actually putting on chain, we, we submit into data availability. So... Um, you also have this concept of verifiers that actually verify that the data structure and the verification process work correctly. Um, and now anyone can run that uh, verifier, but in the future, it's also kind of like a network uh, agreement. And what it does is that we can substantially uh, reduce the cost. Uh, but most importantly, we don't have any more, um, we are not limited on the concept of, um, let's say, block space or block time, because if you think about Polygon, you have a new block every two seconds and you have a certain amount of blocks, block space that you need to share with other um, applications and actions that are happening on Polygon. Uh, so you don't have that challenge anymore. But we are using Polygon for things where you want to have blockchain security and execution. So profiles, for example, and, and handles are stored on, on Polygon. And then if you want to do smart contract-based um, interactions. So for example, if you want to create things like collectible content, um, you can, you can make an on-chain, uh, uh, transaction as well, or you can bring a, an existing transaction that is in Mooka and lay them in, in on-chain if, if the, maybe your user actually gets excited about the content and wants to mint. So it just showcases like how different solutions they are. Um, uh, but also like how much throughput it allows because you don't have the component of block time and block space. Yeah, the, the throughput, I, I think the industry is starting to learn is the true bottleneck that is really hard to scale on these blockchains and these off-chain data availability committees are definitely pushing uh, yeah. to make that easier for quite quite a few people. Yeah, exactly. It's it's I, um, I think Momoka is quite unique solution and... Um, it's really hard to say what it is, whether it's a, some sort of like a optimistic, um, hybrid solution or, um, a roll up. So, because end of the day, data availability layers are also, you know, they are layer ones, but you know, there's no execution. So it's, it's a completely different, uh, um, animal. So, but, it, but, it, but this is just showcases that these kind of solutions are needed for social gaming everything that has like a lot of data that um, you, you can't necessarily manage efficiently and in scale with, with, with a blockchain infrastructure. Yeah, no, it's, it's super interesting to kind of watch it all unfold. I think uh, it's been fascinating just looking at the different architectures, seeing what people are doing. Ethereum obviously took uh, the L2 path, uh, Avalanche did subnets, uh, some of the newer chains, such as Lana and Aptos Sui, took the high data throughput and parallelization. When you were doing some of the the analysis on different infrastructures, ultimately you decided to deploy on Polygon and then use uh, the data availability layer with Mimoka. Did you explore any other chains? Because there, as I said, there's a lot of different ones. And I think, obviously, I think, 
because it is so early in the industry, a lot of people have very strong opinions about all of these. Yeah. Um, I'm curious just how you and your team ultimately settled on Momoka and what other solutions you ultimately looked at at the infrastructure side. Something that was very um, quite important for us is that um, we have a lot of flexibility for developers and the users. Um, and some way, um, kind of like unintentionally, Momoka allows to actually um, you know, go in in a bit in in a bit direction where lens could be Web three social layer a- across all of these uh, networks uh, in a way where, for example, if a user um, is using something like um, Solana or um, they could store their profiles there, they could store uh, their handles, for example, they can even mint. You know, if they see an interesting transaction, um, let's say they they see an interesting music NFT that is a Momoka, they can actually choose where they mint it. Uh, so they can mint it on, on um, Solana or L2 or Avalanche. So those things are possible now because of uh, Momoka. So in some ways, Momoka is kind of like a, um, um, a, 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 a big like a decentralized uh, database where you can actually grab the data and then decide what, what you want to do with it, where you want to tokenize, um, where is your audience. This flexibility is very important, especially when we're looking back um, into how we actually um, we were we were interacting with a lot of the communities in Ave uh, because Ave was first that went to uh, first of the biggest protocols that went to uh, Polygon, Avalanche, and Altus, and uh, you know even in the asset listing process in the very early we we were as a community listing assets that you know were seen very early, kind of like a bit slightly more long-term tail risk. So we always saw these different communities as as new audiences. Um, and because we are building something that is uh, infrastructure, you really want to be as unopinionated as possible and, and, and provide flexibility. And I've been dealing the, the kind of like a strong opinion thing. I, I think people just need to relax and cho- let people cho- choose whatever they want to. You know, if, if security is the issue, like just to use something that is more secure, pay more gas. Um, you know, people just need to be more open into uh, whatever innovation uh, there is. And I, I really hate it because I see, I see constantly over the years where you know there's um, there is sort of like kind of like um, camps where you know it's just tech. You know, it's they have different kinds of use cases eventually where they're gonna steer towards. So it's it's uh, it, it's more interesting to just you know be heads down and building things than, than just arguing. 100% agree. And I, I appreciate the pragmatism, I think, especially as early as we are in the industry, being very pragmatic, focusing on building the best possible products and creating user experiences that people love is kind of the thing that I think sometimes crypto can be missing just because we're uh, always debating different uh, nuances on Twitter. But we forget that at the end of the day, if we want to grow the pie, we need to get people excited and love the products that we're building. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so uh, no, it's, it is it is interesting. Um, with, so with Momoka, and kind of being the state of availability layer, do you see ultimately more projects or people interested in using the services now that you've kind of uh, migrated Lens and kind of a big name to do so? Yeah, I mean, end, end of the day, um, Momo, what what Momoka currently supports is that you have um, you can you can create Momoka posts and comments. And also you can uh, create Momoka mirrors, basically sharing content. And uh, l- the, the cool thing is that uh, regardless of what you're using in the background, so if you're creating on-chain posts or data availability um, posts, um, in, in terms of like an integrator, uh, you, you're dealing usually with something like Lens SDK or uh, interacting with um, some reach layer like Lens, uh, Lens API or some other uh, third-party ones where... You don't really um, you don't really see the, the 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 kind of like a change. So um, a lot of things are abstracted away um, from the interface, and it's easy to integrate, which is quite great because one of our goals is was to was to make it super easy, not only for the Web three uh, developers but the the newcomers as well that are coming to 
uh, Web3 space or first time uh, integrating, or they might want to integrate it to a existing Web2 uh, application. Um, down the line, we've, uh, we want to make a support where you can actually create um, uh, Momoka, um, you can create on-chain posts, but also comment with, with Momoka comments into those on-chain posts. So have that kind of like a cross um, refer- referencing. And um, now we, we recently wrote also a Rust client uh, for Momoka. So that's something that is coming quite soon, which is quite great. Um, our, our team, our engineering team, they, they, they did love Rust. So it's, it's um, yeah, it, it just showcases that how kind of like uh, flexible and unopinionated we, we're trying to, to be as we move uh, forward. So I guess with being able to execute or mint any NFT uh, on Momoka or use any other kind of execution layer, uh, Lens will kind of just expand to all chains uh, on the execution side or kind of be agnostic on the L1 side, expanding to different ecosystems and just continue to post that data back down to Momoka. Yeah, I think what, what Momoka actually does is that it showcases that, you know, it, it, when the data isn't on chain, for example, um, it can be grabbed from there. So in case the Lens community, they want to um, deploy infrastructure or on another network, they can do so. Um, and then that what, what it actually means is that um, uh, you can actually have also... Um, Profiles there, you can actually bring those transactions on chain, for example, for tokenization, uh, which is kind of interesting because in the Lens community, there is um, tons of um, uh, creators uh, from music, art, um, and and also video. There, there's sort of podcasts, actually. I, I think we should get this podcast I would uploaded. love to post my podcast on uh, Lens. Yeah. Let me know when I can actually, do it. Yeah, there's, there's also like LensTube, which is... Um, I, I think it, I don't think it was a hackathon project, but it was like a weekend project of uh, um, one of the community developers, and uh, it's actually quite uh, like super smooth functional experience, and people upload videos there. Um, so there's sort of podcast there. I would love to get this there and even collect uh, collect this one and have it as an NFT. So, um, but yeah, so so there's sort of creators. So I, I think that choice is important and. What I'm super happy about about the Web3 space is that, like the the, the creator u- user base is spread across. So they are not like only on, for example, on Ethereum or Polygon, but they're they're a bit everywhere. And I think that's super um, su- super valuable because that creates those kind of like a micro communities, um, which is which is quite great. I do agree. Uh, maybe last question on the lens front, and then I would love to kind of transition and talk a little bit more about Ave. Uh, with kind of these different solutions, I think one hard part for like the user aspect is to understand some of the decentralization nuances, uh, like the L2, L3, L1. Uh, they're all kind of confusing, even if you're technical and try to understand the different trade-offs. How do you feel like the users should kind of understand these, or do you feel like Ultimately, the goal is for the engineers to handle some of those complexities and just try to abstract it as much as possible. Yeah, I think people. Um, I, I think the abstraction is is an that's that's a uh, necessity. So, um, and I think a lot of the stuff has been abstracted that way. So on on lens, the 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 clients, for example, you don't really pay gas. You don't sign for those transactions. The typical things that you do on on chain. Um, so that's that that doesn't. Existed. And then we need to figure out how we can actually onboard a lot of um, people in, in a more scale without has, ha, without actually like um, needing to to struggle with the seed words and, and whatnot. But I, th- I think more abstraction is needed. Um, and then when it comes to actually like what is the essential whatnot, I think that's where the community comes into play, where um, like either it's like Lens, but a larger um, Web3 social or larger um you know the 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 crypto community can see like okay what is decentralized and what what should be what not and having those debates and discussions and i think that's where we find the kind of like a uh fine line where what what you should be using um and i think that's um 
I, I think that's how we f- find things. And those discussions and debates then will translate into uh, developments and, and all the way back to the uh, users. And I think those users who value decentralization, they will be also kind of like one of those messengers and stewards of um, of, of the ecosystem. And what I think is also important to uh, to see is that in DeFi, uh, decentralization is a kind of like a spectrum. Um, in Web3 Social, uh, it is a spectrum, but also it, it goes in a far, far like a wider uh, spectrum where, you know, you have to like uh, see where you actually need execution or only data availability um, or both. So it's definitely been super um, exciting time for me to to learn everything um, and how to to build uh, social media on on chain. So <laughs> it's it's definitely hasn't been easy. No, I, I, again, I, I think you took the most extremes of uh, two very challenging industries to take on uh, by the horn. So uh, kudos to you. And I, I, I love the pragmatism. I, I think that, again, is missing in crypto and just being uh, letting the community decide and go where the users ultimately end up. And I think, again, that is something that has been a little bit of a challenge for the industry, but it's super refreshing just to hear that you and your team are taking this approach. Uh, we need more builders that are focused on users. And I think it kind yeah. of even points to you in the industry just kind of being as evolved as early as you have, but learning a lot of kind of the tips and tricks along the way. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I think we we have to start thinking of that con- consumer aspect and 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 working from there uh, towards like how the tech then has to work. Uh, yeah, I, I do agree. Uh, so transitioning maybe to the end of the podcast, uh, Ave, uh, I think again you're pushed the space forward in Ave and what. Ave has been able to accomplish. And I think right before I looked at the, or we started the podcast, I saw Ave had almost 8 billion in TVL, which is uh, a very big number. What, I guess, looking forward in the future, what are some things that you would still like to accomplish on Ave? What's kind of, what are you looking forward to, maybe for the rest of the year, but in terms of where you would like to see the protocol grow? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things happening during this year. For example, there's um, the, so there's the Go um, stablecoin, uh, there's the v 3 governance, um, and there's constant uh, small upgrades as well related to the uh, ecosystem. But um, I think we're in a place with the Aave protocol where it's really, um, for first of all, it's quite decentralized. So we're not the only um, ones that are contributing and there's different risk contributors as well, Gauntlet, Chaos Labs, and um, there's delegate platforms. So they, there's an actual uh, decentralized governance there. What's, what has been amazing to see that how that coordination works and, and, and proposals getting uh, voted and discussions um, have been um, uh, initiated in, in different forums and there's like a formal process. So that has been super exciting uh, to see. And going forward, I think that the the roadmap is quite interesting for um, end of the year. And I, I think kind of like there's still interesting things that you can uh, improve on the protocol level. Um, and um, as, as we fa- find always within our team, like we always are looking that maybe this is the, this is the last version that actually is going <laughs> to be like good, you know, and we don't probably see yeah. changes. You know, it's, it's just like a few months later, we realized that, oh, we can actually improve this a bit more or we have some interesting new things that we could add. So I, I think I think it's going to be um, uh, it's kind of like building a probably like a game console or like an iPhone. So, you know, this is the version three and, and you know, iPhone is on version what is it, 13 or so? And <laughs> yep. <least>. yeah, <laughs> just, just release new versions. Well, I guess, I mean, part of that challenge, I think, and this is uh, unique to the crypto and blockchain industry, is that decentralization and governance aspect. Uh, it's both a pro and a con. And yeah. I think also something that the space is still learning how to do correctly or what different variations uh, the, going back to the community they really want. What have been some of your learnings on the uh, decentralization and governance side of things? 
decentralization governance side of things is it's definitely like uh, I, I think decentralization really means decentralization. It means that you can go into the forums, propose something, and that might not work. Or you create even go as far as you can create it. Um, uh, a proposal and that might not get voted in. So it actually removes everything from the team to to be able to um, to be able to 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 manage or control uh, the protocol, which is kind of interesting feeling because it's basically you know your baby, but you know it's you, and you have things that you um, could see kind of like visioning where the direction should go, but there's actually a different stakeholders and group of people that you have to talk to and coordinate. Uh, which is great because, as you mentioned, the protocol has 8 billion TVL. The, the peak probably was 28 or so um, billion TVL in um, a couple of years ago or, or so. So um, those kind of things, you have to kind of have um, a lot of diligence and a lot of people around. And I think one of the biggest reasons why DeFi will take over is that because of the transparency, the smart contract execution and that like a former governance process, um, you actually have a financial system that is auditable every single second. Um, so it really means that uh, there's so many people looking at the, at the code itself. We still find people looking at the version one of the code and it's uh, quite interesting. So like, and there's a lot of people looking at the risk parameters and doing their own assessment. So there's a lot of involvement for, um, from the community, and it surprises me that how big the community actually is. Um, and I think that's how you want to build public goods, especially that are you know very important to the um, you know humanity and society, which is uh, which finance is. Um, and that's why I think it's it's just like a more better infrastructure, um, and 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 the reason where we're going. And for me, now that has been super exciting to see on. The other governance, for example, we have a lot of new delegate platforms. Like I personally, if, if someone is listening uh, this podcast, I definitely recommend to become a delegate and just become active in the governance. And other governance is, is one of the most exciting because there is a straightforward process, um, a lot of contributors, and it's an open, inclusive environment. Um, and, and and definitely recommend kind of like to contribute as well. One hundred percent. No, it's a. Uh... It's just been fascinating. I mean, watching from afar, definitely not uh, as close uh, as you have been to it, but watching the progress of these decentralized networks, uh, whether that's Lens or Ave, uh, it is fascinating. And I think we're learning and uh, you've navigated it beautifully uh, as much as possible. These challenges are new uh, and you're really pushing the space forward in, in that front. I in terms of like, I think now going back to maybe to a little bit of the infrastructure side, Ave has kind of deployed to a lot of various different L2s, uh, deployed in Avalanche ecosystem uh, on the EVM. Would the community in your mind, do you think you would ever explore like non-EVM uh, blockchains or with the Solana virtual machine or even some of the virtual machines for the newer ecosystems coming out of uh, Meta with uh, Aptos and Sui? No, it's actually a question because um, I, I think the portability of EVM is fascinating. It really reminds me of something like like the, the Unix systems where um, you, you, you basically can, can port it and you can build an uh, operating system. Um, and small to run run the programs. I um I, I definitely think there's a challenge uh, when it comes to the um, building another language, but it's not really a challenge. It's more of a resource question. So how much our team puts resources and time into building something in a new language, um, and then securing those um, smart contracts. Um, and that's a, that's a challenge with with with, with DeFi, especially with Ave, is that whatever is being built, it has to be very resilient um, and it has to work as 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 design, but also design has to be um, something that is like uh, meets the expectations what what the protocol you know should function. Um, so I don't see it as an issue. I I actually would love to see that happen. 
um, and, and, and getting into a place where we could actually uh, build that and, and um, get exposure to a, a new uh, community. So I, I will personally love to see that. And I think that will be very exciting because it will really ignite some of the Rust um, specific um, uh, networks. So definitely it will be cool. The the rust is loved by uh, programmers. So uh, no, yeah. we, we'd love to uh, see some of your talents taken to uh, explore to other ecosystems as well. I, I think what you guys have built and is really has pushed the industry forward. And on on that front, I think for a lot of founders, investors, engineers, watch the podcast. It's a little bit more technical. Sometimes we do technical deep dives on different layer ones, layer twos, and uh, the kind of small incredulities between those, what would you say to engineers or people that want to get involved in Web3 or crypto and just kind of jumping in and building in these different ecosystems from building such a successful product? I mean, obviously, like, first thing is is to build as less as possible and iterate, um, trying something that to see whether it, it, it works. Um, so it's, it's way better than going into a basement for two years and, and building something and, you know, um, and, and, and just moving, moving quickly, trying to iterate things and talking to users is very valuable. I think we too much listen to the, um, we too much kind of like look into social media and what's happening there, what's people, what people are talking about. Um, and also looking into what, you know, exist already, but like actually talking to users could help quite a lot to understand, you know, what they actually need and what direction you have to take your uh, product. So I think those are the best um, learnings from, from my side. Uh, it seems relatively simple, but often we tr- skip over the skim- simple things such as talking to users to try to make things harder. So I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and- in, in terms of what you're looking forward to, either in the ecosystem, personally, whether it's what you would like to see happen on Aave or what you would like to see happen on Lens, what things would you like to see happen for the next, say, year or two years? Something I would love to see in terms of like concrete, obviously, I want to see the ecosystem still mature and grow. Um, and if, if there's builders that are excited to build something uh, on Lens or Aave, you know, feel free to uh, DM me on, on Lens or um, on, even on Twitter. Um, something I want to see being built is kind of like a, um, a governance forum based on Lens. Um, and I think that's where the data availability really kicks in um, and the idea of having a decentralized non-custodial profile um, because you don't really give any data um, compared when you log into usually um, uh, Web2 social media platforms, you, you, you basically give data, give uh, emails to, to log in. So uh, a, a, a um, decentralized um, bulletin board for governance forms could be very good. Uh, and, you know, some of the um, clients, they integrated Snapshot as a voting mechanism. So there's sort of things you can actually do. Um, so that's concrete. I... I'm super excited to also see more open algorithms. So the beauty of Lens is that the, all the data is really uh, open. So anyone can come and, and, and just um, build algorithms that are based on um, openness and um, gives that choice to the users. And on our side, I really would love to see more um, payment applications, um, especially on Go. So Go is on um, early testnet, so you already can uh, build some exciting things there maybe some sort of a checkout widget or uh, something similar. So, um, yeah, I think those those are the things that come come into my mind uh, for now. In terms of um, personally kind of the state of the different ecosystems, bull market, bear market, what have some have been your personal lessons just like building throughout both? I think there's less of a like a, there's less of a noise on bear market, but um, at, at the same time, um, it's 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 a time that things move slowly. On the bull market, you have a lot of things happening at the same time, so there's a lot of distractions, and it seems that there's just like a, this huge overflow of information, which is uh, quite challenging. So 
Um, but yeah, I think you have to experience both um, end of the day. Yeah, no, they're wild swings for sure. I think crypto is like no other industry where ultimately it keeps you on your toes. There's always surprising news, good and bad. But uh, I think it, that's what makes it exciting because the space is relatively small. We're pushing it forward. We're getting user adoption. We're bringing finance on chain. Uh, lots of exciting things to look forward to. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited for uh, for the future and um and also like everyone who is building um, at, at these times and, and building the, the future, huge um, respect. And um, if anyone needs help or um, to to uh, chat, I'm, I'm always um, somewhere around. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you again, Sonny. Really appreciate you coming on the podcast, uh, sharing the vision for what Lens ultimately will become, what you have built with Ave as amazing and helped the industry really grow uh, when it was still very small. So thank you again. Uh, appreciate you sharing your wisdoms. Thank you so much, Logan. It was, was a pleasure to be here.